welcome to Voice Acting 101 or whatever we're calling it. Are we teaching or are we Q&A? <laughs> that's, that's up to we're you guys. Uh, why don't we introduce first? Start down there with uh, you, Mr. Martin. What's up, everybody? I'm Josh Bart from Dragon Ball Z, Mashapu. Chris Rager, you guys know me as Mr. Satan and King Yemma from Dragon Ball. Yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> to my left. Cynthia Kranz, um, Chi Chi and Mrs. Briefs in Dragon Ball, both Tawn and you, you and Mitzi and Shin Chan and 20 years of other characters. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm Colleen Clickenbeard and and they know so much. Um, and so they'll translate it all and they'll actually add little notes off to the side that let us know specific things like, oh, by the way, in the manga, this character is gonna come back and be a big character or anything that m might be missed, possibly. Uh, and then our adapters go through and adapt the script so that it takes the translation and makes it not sound translation-y, makes it sound like people talking. Um, and they make sure that the mouth movements will match the words. Which is so easy with English speaking matching Japanese cadence. Oh, yes. <laughs> so easy. That's an easy job for them. <laughs> and there are all those little things like, itadakimasu. We don't say that. <laughs> Thanks for all the food. Um, and uh, so they take that and they make it match the flaps in a Word document that will have a uh, number, a line number, your character name. So uh, this is line number 44. This is Chi Chi. Uh, the character is saying these words at this time code. Uh, and this is a note from the director or the, from the writer to let you know what's going on. So that's kind of the format of the, of the, the Word document. And then uh, the director casts the episode pulls all of the uh, actors in through our amazing talent coordinator, Tara, who ha has like a computer. I don't know how God she does God bless it. that woman. She's amazing. What she has to put up with oh is my gosh. ridiculous. I can't even fathom. I can't believe she still works sane. there. <laughs> I can't believe she's still sane. Yeah, I mean, I just know my flakiness at times to forget things and this and that, and then there's all the rest of the actors who are just yeah. like me. <laughs> So we have nine booths going uh, day and night, and uh, that means that she has that many shows to schedule. So she needs to know that Eric Vale is coming in on Monday for these four hours, and then he's also needed for half an hour in this booth, half an hour in this booth, 15 minutes in this booth, and then somebody else might want him somewhere else. So she has to like perfect it all. That's then amazing. you add the simul dub with the, <laughs> the time crunch that didn't used to exist. Yes, we do one a week now, one episode a week. Uh, of each show, which is um, both awesome and more difficult, uh, but totally worth it because you guys get to enjoy the content as it comes out. Anyway, hurrying. Uh, okay, so now uh, we are in the booth. The director has called in you, and what do you do? Why don't you describe the acting process? Um, I get a call from Tara that says, uh, Colleen needs you at 2 o'clock on Wednesday from 2 to 3.30, and I may or may not know what show it is. I may or may not know what character it is. I get in the booth. On the left, I see some lines, mine highlighted. On the right, I see the screen. They may give me a little background of what's happening in the scene at that moment. Then we'll watch it in Japanese once, and I will try to memorize my line and watch the mouth flaps and see, is the yell a yell, or is it full on chi-chi? And then, and then 
three beeps and on what would be the fourth, I start talking. And that's, that's a skill that they didn't teach drama when I was <laughs> coming up <laughs> in the early 90s. Yeah. You all understand that, right? It's a, well, where did I go? Yeah, where did you go? Uh, hey, I die. That's all right. I die in There it is. You're back. Oh. No, you're not. Hello. Check. Hello. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so it's a three beep system. So I'm, everyone, just to kind of practice this, all right, uh, on the fourth imaginary beep, I want everyone to clap. So I'm going to go beep, 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 and on the fourth one, we're all going to clap together. Okay, and that's when you start talking, all right? Just so you can kind of get the feel for that. Ready? Beep, beep, beep. Good job. Hired. You're hired. <laughs> and that's how the lines work, right? Josh, you that's about it. to no. add anything? I'll probably, I'll probably just be following along here and uh, letting the pros teach you how to do it. Okay, but, um, why don't you tell them about um, the reactions? The reactions, oh, uh, you usually have one chance to watch it, and uh, and then the next time you watch it, you're recording it. What about terminology, Josh? What would you see terminology-wise for a reaction? I usually see a lot of letters. In it. <laughs> <laughs> you, here, just, can we share? I use. Oh my God. Whoo! <laughs> 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 that uh, made me okay. Way back here now. I got it. I got it. We. We didn't do a sound check. Sorry. Normally we do that first. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I usually see a bunch of letters when I do uh, reactions. Uh, they're M N S, shocked. That what means mouth not shown. Shocked. I like that. That's right. That's great, great because you don't have to match flaps. But uh, yeah, C T, clenched teeth. Yes, right. What would you imagine C M meant if you saw that in a script? C M. What was that? Yeah. Closed mouth. mouth. Yes. Yes. yes, there, yes. yes. And then it, uh, you know you follow the the script and the directions, and then you follow the the uh, video, and you do your best to to do all of the emotional needs for the yeah. scene and uh, make it make it work. <clears throat> and then you wait to hear. All right, uh, moving on. Or okay, um, this time, don't suck. Are you uh, being me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, There's I'm not. There's only like two female directors. Who are you being right I now? I was being Mike McFarland, <laughs> actually. <laughs> I've, he's my friend. I've known him for it. On that note, though, I do have to say, one of Colleen's directions to me on like, I was having a really bad day, and it was probably our 18th take, and she said, okay, I want you to do it again, but this time sound like you're not about to cry. Because I was literally in the booth cringing, like, I'm sucking today. <laughs> Sorry. Is it the funny story? <laughs> there is no crying in anime. There is no crying in anime. <laughs> unless, unless your character's crying. I went through a really mean period. <laughs> that wasn't mean. I, kudos, you were being really nice. It was a really bad day, and you were just like, try not to sound like you're about to cry. <laughs> Colleen's so, very demanding. I am. I'm pretty demanding. That's Rightfully so. That's a good show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's basically how it works. And your typical line would like have a line like it might say, um, "Hey, let's get out of here." Open mouth la laugh, O M laugh, uh, and then an underlined line like, "Okay, is everybody ready?" And underlined means that we're not going to see their mouths anymore. So regular line would be like with no underlining means you're on screen. I can see your mouth moving. Um, hey, let's get out of here. And then for open mouth laugh, you just go <laughs> beep, beep, beep. <laughs> and then an underlined uh, everybody ready means that it looks like this. Everybody ready? And you don't see my mouth. All right. We love those. And then a lot of the magic happens with the engineer. Like we used to have to do a lot of takes that before they could take out a mouth sound or it sounded a great take, but it just needed to be squished a tiny bit or stretched. And... So I don't think they get maybe as much public uh, appreciation from you. You don't know how much the engineers do. Yeah. But kudos the to them. unsung heroes. They're the ones that we all praise in the booth constantly. No doubt. Go back through your DVDs and your Blu-rays and stuff like that, and you look on there and you find that ADR engineer, and then you go like them on Facebook or Twitter or something. You follow yes. these guys because yeah. they're the ones doing it. They're the only ones doing any real work up yes. there. Yes. 
we get call their it autograph. Fun mating. They yeah. do the fun mating part. Yes. <laughs> All we, right. I so usually nickname them a magician. Yes. Like uh, Chris Angel or something like that. He's like, so. <laughs> I like <it. laughs> Chris Angel. <laughs> After you. I'll just hold this here. All right. Are we ready for questions now? Now that we have the basic gist of what we do. Okay. And we've, we're ignoring so many parts, by the way. Like next, it goes to mix. <laughs> there, are, there are producers. That part. that part's interesting. To I'm, I'm, I, I mean, the engineers will take everything and they turn it in at the end to a mix engineer, and the mix engineer goes through in the Pro Tools session and and makes everything sound like it's all in the, the right room. So they're gonna add the filters if it's in a cave. They're gonna add something if it if there's a mask. They add an effect that makes it sound like it's covered up. Uh, if it's just outside or in an arena or on a microphone, all those things that you don't think about, they have to texturize all of that. And our mixers are so amazing. They're so amazing that sometimes the licensors want our mix. Like mm. it's really, they're, they're really amazing. Okay. This gentleman here, you sir, yes. Stand up. <laughs> 10 points, good job. Do we need a mic? <laughs> Just, yeah. No, I'll, I'll be loud. Um, so for aspiring voice actors, I've heard the industry is pretty closed. It's kind of like who you know, you've got to make connections and stuff. Um, but that's from obviously people who aren't voice actors saying that. So asking the ones who are not on YouTube saying, you want to get in voice acting? Here's how you do it. How do you do it? Like real, real talk. Real talk <laughs> is you need to be able to act. Right. And most of us grew up with theater backgrounds improv, yeah. other things like voice training, dialects. Um, so if you don't have that in your bag, and I also like to say, don't limit yourself to voice acting. There's so many genres. Yeah. That's my two cents. Here, you guys share that one. We'll share this one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, you know, and honestly, in anime specifically, uh, and, and, you know, probably video games too, you know, we do have a lot of people coming from all kinds of different uh, creative outlets, you know, whether it's music, opera, uh, singing, um, <clears throat> uh, theater, uh, you know, some other creative aspect, you know. I mean, creativity is creativity, and I think once you have a creative mindset, once you kind of push yourself into another style of creativity, you can probably pick it up pretty well pretty quickly, in my opinion, you know. But we kind of come from all kinds of different places. I mean, most of us here came from that theater, uh, that uh, that stage, uh, improv, Josh and I. Uh, you know, so it does take all times. But at the end of the day, it really does come down to experience. And when that opportunity comes along about who you know and, and those kinds of things, yes, it is about who you know. But in that moment, are you ready? Right. You know, I, so. Classic point. One of my biggest regrets of my life is musical theater is what I was studying. Sorry. You wrong. took the wrong mic. Colleen, I did it wrong. I'm sorry. I just and them to, uh, you guys so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Broadway, but one of the biggest Broadway legends is Tommy Toon. Well, his sister lives in Fort Worth, and I was taking tap from her. And she's, I'd been doing it for two months. I was 23. And she said, I, Tommy's holding auditions for the touring group of Will Rogers Follies, which was the show I loved. She's like, I think you should audition. In my insecure 23-year-old brain was like, oh, you're so sweet, but I'm not ready. It didn't occur to me to go, she's his sister, she's a professional tap dancer, and she could coach me and get me ready. And that comes into the be ready when the opportunity happens. Because I still, I'm 50, and I'm still beating myself up that I had a shot at doing a Broadway show. So, yeah, be ready when the opportunity comes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for, for myself, Josh and I, we were in a comedy troupe, Section 8 Comedy, and uh, we knew Mike McFarland, who we'd met working at a restaurant called Dick's Last Resort, oddly enough. Uh, it's, a, it's a restaurant where your waiters are dicks. Uh, and uh, so uh, we met him there, and then one day Mike comes into uh, the show one night. We're setting up for a show, and he's like, hey, man, I just booked some uh, gig out in Fort Worth, Texas, and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, Mike can do it. I know I can do that. You know, so I was, you know, but it was that moment of, look, I'd done years of improv. I'd gone to acting school. I'd been to, uh, in theater and plays and taken many different, mi multiple kinds of classes, camera and movement and voice and all these things. And in that moment, I was ready, you know, and I went, auditioned, I got a part, you know. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a lot of those experiences, uh, being able to 
find that opportunity is going to be less likely and you know in that moment are you going to be ready so it is about accumulating experiences and if you can't go out there and get that in professional world make it on your own that's that's what we did you know we started our own comedy troupe and decided to you know try to build up a name that way you know and people we did we got noticed and people noticed that's us and how he got it. Yeah, yeah so and Sabbath. tell your story josh chris Sabbath came to see our show and he saw me do a character called the pillsbury homeboy <laughs> and uh and he he came up to me and he said uh we've got this new character coming up and uh it's called majin boo and i think uh i think you'd be good and so I went in and I, I just started, re I'd never heard of Dragon Ball Z, you know, but I was prepared for the opportunity to go in and, and do it because I'd done improv. I, I didn't have a problem taking a chance and make a fool out of myself for better or worse. Uh, and a cliche that I've heard before that I always love is luck is being prepared for opportunity. So there are plenty of people who win the lottery they weren't prepared for that opportunity because they wind up even more poor, more destitute than before. Other people, that it's the best thing in their life and it, it works out. They were prepared for that opportunity. And I actually don't, I, I don't think it's such a closed circuit. Um, I know that that is, is something that we used to hear a long time ago, I think because uh, so many people were getting into the business based on who they knew. But that was largely because there was so little of it happening. And now at Funimation, we have 18 to 22 dubs going at, at, at any given season. Uh, and that's insane. That's just in Dallas, Fort Worth. <laughs> uh, so we are constantly in need of new actors so that our dubs don't all sound the same. Uh, and we pull from the acting pool in our area, which is, is really the way it works. So if you are acting in a place where something is being created, you are that much more likely to be a part of that which is being created. If you are in theater in Dallas and you get to know Caitlin because she is also in theater in Dallas and she thinks you're fantastic, then maybe she's gonna pull you in for an audition. And that's how people get into Funimation now. It's, it is who they know, but it's because they're putting themselves out there and, and making themselves available. Yes, and. <laughs> no, yes, and I. Where's the mic go? Are we down to one? Oh, my gosh. No, we have one. Oh. We have our own. There's not a lot one. of room to do a lot of improv in, in dubbing because you, it's not prelay. But, but I use skills I learned in improv for your, I have to come, like, I've never been a princess, so I have to come up game called 10 things I come up with what are 10 things about a princess on a battlefield okay or you know that we, I use some of the skills I learned but I don't we don't quite have the freedom as much as in like a video game where you might be able to put a ha ha after a line because there's not flaps to match I will say though with a show like Dragon Ball where we've been playing these characters for a long time we do have little opportunities to add in a little more of that character that we think might be missing right. in a line. Uh, so not so much improvising it per se, but after we read the line, like you might look at the director and the engineer and be like, can I try this? I'm gonna do this or, I'm gonna, or, or they may be even asking you, hey, do you like that? Do, you, do we have something funnier there that we can maybe do? So we have a little room there, but improvising to flaps is just not a thing possible really. Plus so. we're stuck so much closer to translation than we used to do. Right? Yes, it is much more closely, you know, to, to what the Japanese have done. Even overall tone and everything too. You know, these days uh, I really try to listen to what the Japanese actor is doing before me. Yes. For Basically for overall tone, I'm not really trying to match their voice per se, uh, but I am trying to match that tone. Uh, and so... Intensity in their read or... Yes. So having that listening skill that is that improv thing, you know, being able to listen and hear that and feel the beat, feel the tone, feel the timing of it and everything, uh, very much is something that takes place when you, when you learn the imp skills of improv, so And yes. another thing I use is uh, physical adjustments. Yeah. So I find myself doing the stance that my character is and that helps, or an emotional adjustment. I mean, those are a lot of the 
skills you learn through games and improv, right? So those are some of the things that I find helpful. And physicality is important. Uh, you know, as little room you have in that booth, being able to engage the parts of your body that that make those sounds in real life. You know, you're throwing a punch and you're just going, huh, you know, or are you going, huh, you know, I mean, that's a, there's a difference there. So being able to engage yeah. those parts of your body, you don't got to flail your arms around, but, you know, I did. engage those parts. I you had know? to say abracadabra in one, one <laughs> game where I play, um, you know, a mystic. And, and I found myself going abracadabra. I mean, and I didn't even notice till I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it didn't the sound the same without the... You know, the flair. Ian Sinclair likes to make fun of me because he's watched me in the booth uh, doing some Mr. Satan. He's like, you realize you pop your hands the entire time you're doing that? So when you're doing Mr. Satan, <laughs> your hands are always popping. <laughs> hey, guys, guess what? You know? And, uh, like, and you always find your, your thing for your character, yes. like what it is. Are, they, are, is there, are their hands on their hips all the time? Yes. Like whenever I'm struggling a lot of times with Luffy, like anytime he's pulling on something forever, there's uh, – I, I do – if you're genuinely pulling on something, your voice will have a different quality to it. So if you're giving yourself something to have effort with, then it just sounds slightly different, and it doesn't have to sound too different, but it gives you some kind of quality. I'll leave with my arm sore. Anyone watch that uh, little show called Black Butler? Right? J. Michael Tatum, right? When Tatum's in the booth doing that character, this little hand is propped up right here. <laughs> doing things so you know you, you add that little bit of element You're, it's acting it's still acting you just don't have an audience you know but you still got to move classic example chris bevins who was a director for many years with us if i wasn't getting what he needed from me he'd go crayons look at me and i'd look out the window and he would go make this face when you say the line and i'd be like okay and making the face would give him what he needed when i i was like damn that you know what you're doing casein is an improv guy too Case in point. Case in point. Case in point. Improv. <laughs> All right, somebody for the back. I'm sure you've only done this. What about Star Trek? I think if you're looking for specific rates for voice actors, you can find tables uh, online. If you look up uh, non-union voice acting rates, you'll, you'll probably find an hourly rate that sits somewhere in, in what you're looking for. Um, if you're asking somebody to do something for free, then you better not be making any money off of it. Yeah, I mean, rates range. Video games are a little different. Anime is, is, a, is a little bit different. Uh, you know, when you're doing the more union stuff or commercials and things like that, the money definitely begins to change uh, and whatnot. But uh, uh, you can find that online if you're looking to hire people. But uh, at the end of the day, when you're that person making that money, make sure you're putting aside 20% of that yeah. every time you make that check. You can also contact an agency and ask what the rate would be Absolutely. if you wanted to use one of their people for an hour of voice acting and use their rate as your base. What's the hardest thing to do for voice okay. acting. What's what our greatest challenge as voice actors and how do we overcome it? Oh. Not being hung over before I go? No. Okay. For me, for me, <laughs> it is um, that first time when you're watching it, trying to read the words and slightly memorize it while trying to listen for the timing, see the act. It's doing two and three things at one time. We don't have rehearsals. We don't have time. You know, we, we don't have that benefit. So it's it's having to quickly put it all together. To me, that's the biggest challenge is line. So, okay, what's happening line? Um, I don't know about you guys. That. I usually watch, in that situation, it, it is difficult because I usually watch, we'll watch one or the other, right? I'll try to get that line in my head, but I'll watch, watch, the, watch the anime first as I'm kind of looking at the line just to kind of get overall timing. Uh, and then, after I got that timing, I don't look at the anime anymore. I look at the script. And that's uh, why I get so, so mad when, when 
famous people are doing Disney, you know, Angelina Jolie saying it was so hard to be the voice character and I had no one to act off of. And I'm like, bitch, try to match flaps. <laughs> try to act and match flaps. Was that wrong? Was that wrong? I'm sorry. Angelina is a lovely person, I'm Nothing, sure. I mean, we're, we're besties, <laughs> really. But I mean, like, okay. But they animate around what you're doing. Do you do y'all agree that we have a bigger challenge? Thank you. Raise your hand if you're under 15. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think some of the difficulty for me is uh, keeping the same level of engagement the entire time. Uh, because every time you come in as a voice actor, you're in a different place personally, and you have to find a way to shut that off and be exactly who the character needs you to be. Um, and some of those characters are really high energy, and if you're not having a high energy day, you still need to get there. Um, and I think also, it when you do a read, even if you don't feel like it's perfect, if the director feels like that works, you like finding your way toward their vision rather than wanting it to be exactly the way you want it to be all the time. We all have our own individual brains, and so I, like we might not read it exactly the way somebody wants. Like I, I, if I read something and that is what Mike McFarland wants, then I, I have to shut off my director brain and be like, then that's the right read. Because to me, my job is to please the director, yeah. even if I don't. Different people have directed Dragon Ball Z and they've all had a different idea of what Chi Chi, you know, she was this way with one person and then somebody else was like, oh, make her more maternal. And then Sabbath was like, forget that. She's straight up trashy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> tough. And so no matter my opinion, I think my job is to please the director because that's whose vision I've got to, you know, go with. It's too hard to remember. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who do we got? This man here, right here, you. First off, I want to say, excellent. I, I, I've learned so much from sitting here on this panel. Great step for you keeping it right? yeah. <laughs> so, Some of us are. <laughs> uh, I request, I have to do this, if that's okay. And this is not, I, I, I mean, because, it, because of everything that you've done since you've been in, I've watched so many of your movies, and I'm thrilled. But um, as far as forming a relationship with the character, if you have one that you prefer doing uh, No. <laughs> oh, yeah, Yuki. Uh, uh, Yuko. Oh, my gosh. Yuko. <laughs> yeah. She's great. <laughs> right. Yes, but, it, but it's not like there's one particular, like, I like doing the villain or I like doing the comedy. It's never like that. It's, it's that I get really attached to specific characters, and I think that has a lot to do with the writing of the show. So, it, and I don't just mean the adaptive writing. I mean the, the, the writing, the actual series. So the one I'm the most attached to who's the most dear to my heart is Luffy, because I've been doing that for so long, so it doesn't matter how long I'm away from him. If I step in the booth and I get to do Luffy, I light up. I am delighted to be doing him. I, I just, he's so fun, and he's, it's like revisiting a friend when you get back in the booth. And I'm not a, a hyper-emotional person. I don't get super <laughs> attached to things. So, like, that's, that's a big deal for me to say. Like, when I get in there, I get really excited that I'm going to do Luffy again. Um, and then there are some that are <laughs> that are really popular that are not my favorites. I like all of my characters, but that are not my favorites. And then there are some that are not around for very long, like um, Momiji in Good Luck Girl is one of my all-time favorite characters. I would play her every day if I got the chance. And she only had, what, a season? It was it's such a short-lived thing. So it just depends on who, what character you bond with, and it, that has a million different reasons, so I can't give you a specific. 
Uh, and then once you have attached to them, you're probably never going to forget how to slip right back in. And some of the characters, we do these simul dubs so quickly. Um, and so if you're a small character and you're not watching the series, it's, it can be difficult to remember really what's going on or who you are. When you step in the booth, you need to be reminded of, okay, this is what your voice sounded like. This is what was going on in the series. Now this is what's going on in the series. It can be hard to slip back into it. Uh, and there's just no possible way that we could keep up with all of them. So it's not out of lack of affection. It's just lack of time. I want you in my life. Like, I want him to be, right? to follow me around and be positive about everything all the time. Look at him. Yeah, let's hear it. I still want to see your lamp if you have that picture. Okay. Uh, right here in the middle, you, sir. Yes, the hat. Pleasure. Uh, so, close to the point, uh, what I want to ask you is that I went to Dallas a uh, month ago. I really wish I could take an on site tour of Funimation, but of course, that's not allowed, so I understand. But, uh, knowing they, they do that, tours. Yeah, we do tours once a month. Once a month? Uh huh. Uh, yeah, I can say that. I love that. Maybe next time. So, anyway, uh, places to go. I love you. <laughs> I want it. That's a good question. Well, I think you covered a couple you of did, them there. You did, yeah. New York is the other one, but but yeah, yeah L.A. I mean. uh, well, actually, there's a show that's being shopped by Netflix that um, I've been casting and haven't recorded yet called, thank you, Jet Boy, and that's out of Atlanta. And I Atlanta's made that connection too. last year at Bonsai Con in South Carolina. It comes around to you never know. You just never know. Atlanta. And also, now with technology, I mean, don't you find a lot of people that you're sending their demos? Yeah. Really? Like, <laughs> okay, I was mistaken, but like Damon Mills moved here to do Funimation. Yeah. And he was ready when he did, and he's killing it. So some people are committed enough to move, but um, I don't know. I was wrong about the sending the demos. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's what I have, that's what I had been told, but. So um, maybe it is important to live somewhere, yeah. but you know, Atlanta has a lot of stuff going on in At all the acting genres. Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, LA, of course, uh, and then some few places in between there. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, Texas, yeah, there's Sentai there as well. I mean, uh, uh, Vancouver, like you had mentioned, there's a lot of acting opportunities uh, there as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, if this is something you want to make a career of, you are going to have to be in one of those places at some point. You know, uh, uh, being sort of a, a remote actor is not, not quite the thing we've uh, been able to accomplish yet, you know. But it does happen from time to time. But those are more special circumstances when you're yeah. dealing with somebody who's not there, you know, type of thing. But When you've already made a name for yourself and then you move somewhere in right. Wyoming, we'll still use you. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Yes, but at some point, you, then you, know, you need your own setup in your own home with the proper equipment and computers and everything you need to be able to make that process run smoothly. So, Let's well, choose somebody from over here. We haven't done this side, really. Yes. yes. the pros and cons of having a recognizable voice. Um, I mean, they're probably exactly what you would think they would be. Like, I, it, 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 it's great because that means that if somebody sees a character that they think would sound like you, then it's an immediate, like, casting. Um, but then you also have to struggle to make sure that you can find some range. I had to make sure that I could find a boy voice and a mom voice and a little girl voice. Like, let's, let's try to see how far we can push this because you can't always be the same thing. And it's part of the reason I have my own banner is a lot of people only think of me for Chi Chi, but it's the biggest compliment that we're like, I never knew you did this or that or yeah. this or that. 
And I'm like, thank you. Like, I, that thrills me that you didn't recognize me. But I'm also flattered when they immediately knew it was me. It's kind of a double-edged yeah. sword, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, Dragon Ball is not really a great example for your natural voice type of thing. Uh, uh, I do try to tell my people who uh, I, I'd run workshops out of Dallas, and uh, one of the emphasis I really try to make is I want your voice, I want to hear what you sound like, and I want you to make choices based on the character you're, you're playing. Not, I don't want you to make a voice. We make choices, not voices, right? And that's really, Ooh, it right? Rhymes. It does, it does. But it, it, it's really, really true, you know? So, uh, uh, being able to act in your own voice with slight variations of, of, uh, of sort of heavy and light uh, mood and, and things like that, uh, how the person is, his social class, the way he stands or the way she stands, you know, uh, you begin to break down this character physically and mentally, uh, and then you make a choice and you sell that choice, you know, and uh, uh, for me, that's, you know, that's what you really got to be looking for as far as uh, your voice. You know, I know the question was a little different about a recognizable voice, but uh, I wanted to make that emphasis that we look for your voice. I want to hear you act. Well, I love it that Josh doesn't sound anything like Boo. <laughs> <laughs> like, not even a little bit. It's your most recognizable <laughs> voice, and you don't sound anything like that. And I'm typecast. <laughs> Kate, there, there's a little pink monster in uh, Fairy Tale, and really? Kate, it popped up, and Caitlin just called me directly. <laughs> Honestly, when I ha I used to have hair as long as Colleen's when I first started, and then when I cut it really short, I started noticing I'd get called in for all the short brown hair. Like, I think that's how I got me -E in Fruits Basket, because she had my same hairdo. I know that sounds weird, but even that does yeah. happen. No, it, it does happen. Your, your physical traits outside of the world of animation <laughs> will be plugged into the animation. I mean, I... I play a lot of big, loud guys. I wonder why. <laughs> you know. It couldn't be because you sound like that. Nope. <laughs> That's but not it. what just what what? Sorry, I mixed your two names. What Chris was saying is that the the choices that you make change the 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 role. So even though Riza Hawkeye and Yuko sound uh, from Holic sound basically like the same person, just shifting the the perception, shifting the the motivations changes what the voice is. So it's not like I'm always gonna have to do that military, big breasted military woman. Uh, there, there are other people that I can do just by shifting the, the choices that I'm making. I like choices, not voices. That's I nice, I'm stealing that. Me too. Uh, you cannot steal that. I'm stealing that. I'm stealing <laughs> it. Trademark. <laughs> Call Putting it, no it on backsies. anybody's autograph who comes gets me, I'm going to get that on my autographs from now on. That is BS. <laughs> <laughs> you got a question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, ma'am. <laughs> We don't use Actors Access, but we do use agencies who use Actors Access. Okay. So if you have an agent, you're going to have an actor, Actors Access. That's just kind of the way it's going to work. Okay. And that is absolutely a valid way of going about it. Get an Actors Access profile and start building it up and get demos and things like that. Work your way to getting an agent. But I will say that there are very few really good agents who will take you if you don't have experience. Right. Um, and that sounds counterintuitive, like how do I get the experience without an agent? But there are millions of ways. If you if you are involved, we all did it. yeah, we all did it. yeah. If you're involved in acting in this whatever city you're in in theater, then maybe you're gonna get somebody who takes a, a route and becomes a student director, and then you can do a student film, and then one of those we people. Did extra in seven, like every class you take, every every project you've done and pretty soon you have a strong enough resume to get with an agent yeah. and then they will send you out on smaller things and then then pretty soon I mean I remember thinking I'm never gonna have enough and then pretty soon I was having to bump things off my resume for more legit 
better things, and it, it happens quicker than you imagine. Yeah, because, you know, in the beginning, you'll probably have a lot of your schooling and stuff like that, you know, and then from there, you know, you'll uh, work, go and maybe get a part in a, in a, a non-community theater type play dues. or something like you that, yeah, so. You dues and get experience little by little. and contacts and stuff for your resume, and it, it's worth it. This is well, Adam. He's very you polite. Adam, <laughs> Adam has she twice now. He's, I'm a he's come to lady see me. <laughs> he's, he right. called me ma'am because he knows I know. <laughs> but him. Dad, I'm Jesus Christ. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? What can I put? Adam, ma'am. Adam, ma'am. It is Adam, ma'am. <laughs> Shoot. I love to be directed. It's one of my favorite things as an actor. It's what I miss about not being able to audition like live. Oh my God, people. I you hate just it. You send things, you're like, oh God, I hope this works. But that's, I love to be I directed. I love being directed too. I've, I don't think I would be a good, I'm not good at coming up with the big picture and the ideas, but I get a charge out of fulfilling someone's. For a voice actor, you really don't like mics. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm just an, um, a mystery and a riddle. Um, <laughs> no, I love it, like I'm a people pleaser, and so while that can har you know, not always be the most healthy way to be, but, but it's great if you're an actor. I love it when I'm fulfilling someone's vision and I know that they're happy with what I've done. So, but I can't speak to the directing side. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I think, you know, in that process of, uh, uh, Shoot, man, I totally lost what I was going to say, honestly. Uh, your question is, like, what do you like to see in your actors or what do you like to give to your director? You know, uh, at the end of the day, if I am directing, which I did start doing a little bit of directing lately, I put a little, some live action stuff, which is actually really fun, uh, a little bit nuanced and different, but the same. Uh, but, you know, what I'm looking for is somebody who's, who, who's somebody who I, ha I feel like I have to bring down a little bit, you know, because if you're a little heightened, I know I can pull you back. But if you're down here, getting you to come up is like, oh, Jesus, never, this is going to take forever, <laughs> you know? And it is. It's difficult, you know? And as an actor, uh, I really try to have to remind myself that I am listening to the director, you know? Because, look, I've been doing this 20 years, you know? I think I know exactly what should happen, you know? But that may not, but that's not, it's not my vision this time, you know? Uh, now, I have directors that are like, look, you've been playing Mr. Satan, go, you know? And I, I have freedom there, you know? But with other things, you know, I am trying to, uh, supply them with what the thing that they want and uh, yeah we, we all want directions and uh, as far as the audition process goes yeah that just makes me angry I hate auditions these days because auditioning acting is not a one person thing you know I mean it is a, a playing off of others and listening and, a, and, and I coming from that world of improv too having a director is just that one little bit more of information I can take and use and pull and, yeah. and make it my own uh, and, uh, and so yeah that Oh, I hate auditioning these days. I miss auditioning. <laughs> yes. I love, and auditioning is a different skill than acting. I mean, whether it's for a commercial or for theater or for... And to be clear, because most auditions are at home auditions. You have a studio at your house, you're recording from home. Uh, Funimation just does still hold some in the booth ones, and you do have that uh, sort of interaction. But uh, for the most part, video games and otherwise, even commercials, it's you. And, you know better be good at it. I look for <laughs> a lot of things from an actor and it just depends on the character. And I think you'll hear from any different director a million different answers. Um, Cause some directors really like to take people and mold them into something new and like see how far they can, they can pull somebody from what they're used to doing because they get a real a charge out of, out of actively directing. Um, and for me, one of my thrills is to cast a show with people who perfectly fit their roles rather than like, I don't really, I, I don't do a ton of taking somebody and then being like, you've never done this before. And I think that's a great skill and it's really exciting. And as an actor, I love it when people do that. But I, as a director, I really like to take somebody who, to, to find a character and be like, I know exactly the voice that is perfect for that and put that in there. Uh, and then I like, 
both actors who, like Eric Vale, who know the read, like, from the beginning. He comes in, and if he gives you his first read, it's probably almost there. Like, that, he just is... He, he knows how to read. He knows what you should expect. And then there are actors like Barry Andel who uh, comes in and every line he does, the first time out of his mouth, I'm always like, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's great read. I like That is not how I was going to read it in, in my head, and that's amazing. So I can like, I like actors, and I like what actors bring to the table, and it's always fun to see where your relationship with them sits. There are some actors that I use for the same things because they are they are steady and I know that I can count on them to come in and do this thing and that's what I need in that moment because I've got hard person coming in next mm -hmm. and I need I need to get through this. And then there are some actors who come in that I I just love to play with. Like we love to okay, let's try this next. Let's try this next. Um and I, I can even like the difficult, th sometimes the people who are not so easy to direct end up being the people who are the most interesting in the, the final mix um, because their reads are all over the map and you have no idea what to expect, which means that the first five you have to trash. And then the next one is like, that is just weird enough to be really cool. Uh, so there's, there's no real one answer for that question probably. We've got time for one more. Hmm. No, Who's it gonna be? Wally. Who's it you? gonna be? Stand up if you have an awesome question that everybody's gonna love. Go ahead. All right, you're the only one with an arm left up. <laughs> Everyone's like, no, mine's terrible. <laughs> I like that. Have you ever cosplayed as Josh, have you ever cosplayed as Boo? <laughs> I mean, look at me. <laughs> Now, I do wear my own merch. I do wear my own merch. I, I, I have the blue shoes, the blue shirts, socks. So, yes. <laughs> <It's kinda. laughs> but only it's when you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have blue, blue pajamas. No. Uh, you know, oddly enough, I one and one time only did I ever don a Mr. Satan outfit. Uh, and I, I was a regular guest at this con in Boise, Idaho. Uh, it was like my fifth year there. It was called Tomodachi Fest. Uh, and one year they decided, since I came all the time, they were going to have, uh, I was going to have my own con within the con. They called it Rager Con. Uh, and so in like a, in a, in a, yeah, in a one-hour panel, we literally went from opening to closing ceremonies with musical guests, uh, uh, like panel interviews and stuff like that. Uh, we had a cosplay contest and stuff like that, literally in an hour. So it was just this fast, crazy thing. <laughs> Uh, it was hilariously funny. I wish somebody, that's probably on video somewhere. I have to ask those guys in Boise. But, you should uh, make that a panel. So very, very quickly and fast, I, I did don like a big giant wig and a mustache and a gi and everything. And, but then I had to throw it off like two minutes later because we were on to the next thing, you know. But, so yes, that one time. I have not. I have never like straight up cosplayed. I, I have people who bring me their, like somebody has made me a Luffy jacket and um Plenty of people have given me Luffy hats, and so I probably somewhere in all of my stuff have the complete thing, but I've never, I've never donned it. I don't even, I'm, I'm the lamest. Cosplayers hate me. I have, I, I don't even dress up for Halloween. I, I know it's sacrilege, I know, but I, I don't. I don't either. I don't. I read the I'm My the Hero guy manga. I'm like, this is my <laughs> Halloween costume. Yeah. <laughs> Was that it? What time Ladies is this panel over? 4.50. No way. That's a weird 451. time. It's 451. We love you guys. We will be at our table.